Hello and welcome to Cambridge PhD Casts. And today I'm talking to Danica Parrick, uh, who is a PhD student in the Department of Archaeology here at Cambridge. And uh, Danica is taking us uh, the farthest back that the PhD Casts have ever been um, to the Indus civilization. So Danica, if you'd like to give us a brief introduction um, to the Indus civilization. Um, sure, John. It's one of the four Old World civilizations. Um, that's what archaeologists call them. I think now people say civilizations in them. Um, in quote marks, <laughs> yes, exactly. But it's a Bronze Age civilization. Um, it was based in South Asia. Uh, its sites are found from northeast Afghanistan to Pakistan and India. Mm -hmm. uh, so it really covers an enormous amount of, of territory. Mm -hmm. uh, it's contemporaneous with Egypt and Mesopotamia, but it's um, it's much more short lived, really. So uh, the urban phase, um, as we call it, sort of only lasts from about 2600 to 1900 BC, okay. uh, which if you compare it to, to what's going on um, further west, it's really, it's really, really very short-lived. Mm -hmm. And we're not exactly sure why it, why it all came apart. So <laughs> yeah, this is the mystery. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's one of the big mysteries in archaeology. <laughs> And um, what, what, what do we kind of know about it? Is there as much known about it as there is about, say, ancient Egypt or Mesopotamia? Um, absolutely not, actually. In a lot of ways, it's, uh, it's a bit like Indiana Jones archaeology <laughs> because we really know so little about it. Mm -hmm. um, now, the thing about the Indus was that it was, uh, it was sort of only officially discovered in the, in the early 20th century. Um, and so while we've had this, this continuous knowledge of Egypt and Mesopotamia for, for a very long time, mm -hmm. um, we really have only known about the Indus for maybe a hundred years or so, uh, which which is I think which has really played a bit you know Lots a big role English. in how little we know about it. But mm. there's there's a lot of other factors. For instance, although you know they were quite sophisticated and they had developed writing, mm. um, the Indus script has never actually been translated, so we can't read anything that they were <laughs> writing. Um, it must be infuriating. <laughs> it's very frustrating. Yes, yeah, you're, you're so close and yet so far. But um, uh, it's actually it, it, I do find it really frustrating because. Indus archaeologists are sort of in the unique position of um, of studying a complex society, but having to do it using um, sort of prehistoric methods almost. Mm -hmm. So it is really frustrating because you're trying to understand, you know, administration and um, you know how the how the different cities were communicating with each other and things like that. But we have absolutely no way of doing it. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, it is it is very difficult, I think. So over the hundred years or so that we've known about the Indus or since since the rediscovery, what is there anything at all that we can say with with certainty that we know about the Indus? Yeah, there are some things that there we, we can say with, <laughs> with certainty about the Indus. But um, theories about the Indus have developed in a really interesting way. And I think in, in I mean, you can say this for a lot of fields, but mm -hmm. um, <laughs> if you sort of chart the, the development of theories on the Indus, I think there most of them are very um, indicative of sort of the period um, in which, you know, people came up with them and the kind of people who were coming up with them. Um, so the early archaeologists who worked in the Indus, um, of course, they were Indian archaeologists, but they were um, they were sort of overseen or supervised by um, a lot of British colonial archaeologists mm -hmm. a lot of the time, uh, and they were very much in charge of of the excavations and things. Um, and so early theories about the Indus kind of focused on um, how it was a, a homogenous empire, you know, rigidly administered, centrally controlled, uh, and they came up with this idea of uh, of how it had twin capitals because we only knew of two Indus cities at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, in retrospect, a lot of that um, it, it, it's very clear that you know there's all this colonial rhetoric in the mm, background, reading um, a modern day empire into exactly. Relations. And I think it really ties into how um, how the British. Um, were administering India at the time because mm -hmm. they had this this twin capital system of you know a summer capital and a winter capital. Mm -hmm. So it's very telling, um, I it's, think, and, and tells us maybe a little bit more about the archaeologists <laughs> yes. than it does about uh, exactly, about the exactly. Indus. Well, that was the idea at the time, and then mm -hmm. um, sort of as as our understanding developed, we found more cities. So now the Indus, as we know it, um, you know, it's across this huge area. Um, it's got at least four cities that we know of, mm -hmm. um, possibly a fifth, but it's never been excavated, so we can't say for certain. Um, but it's also, you know, there's there's large towns, there's smaller towns, there's villages, there's, mm -hmm. you know, huge other segments of the population doing other things and not living in this urban context. Mm -hmm. um, so these are located across, it's Afghanistan, Pakistan and India? Yes, Sorry. there's there's only one known site in Afghanistan mm -hmm. and there's, there's potentially more, but, uh, but it's, 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 hard to, it's hard to know, <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to know at the moment. Um, but yeah, people speculate that the sites that are a bit further out are potentially... Um, uh, trading outposts, or mm -hmm. this one is near um, sources of of lapis lazuli, and and um, it's potentially they're they're sourcing mm -hmm. the lapis and bringing it back to uh, more central parts of the the civilization. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting that you that you mentioned that. What do we know about trade and communication 
um, within the Indus civilization? Well, I think that, I mean, trade is one of the things in the Indus that, that actually really fascinates me the most because mm -hmm. um, they're extraordinarily well connected. I mean, it's, it's fantastic, really. Um, it's not just within the Indus. I mean, they are engaging in, in international trade as well. We know that they're um, communicating with, um, with people in Mesopotamia um, and we know that they're, they're trading things back and forth. Uh, and in fact, um, there's a mysterious land referred to, in, you know, in, in in texts in the in the Near East called Meluha, uh, mm -hmm. and from the descriptions, people do think it refers to the Indus as well. Okay. Uh, but by tracing sort of the flow of goods, we know that they're trading with each other mm -hmm. within the Indus. Um, it's quite extraordinary because um, they have this really fantastic network of of raw ma raw material like resource procurement, but also um, the sort of this craft production system. Um, so they source these raw materials from all over the place, from, as I said, Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. um, they source carnelian from Gujarat, from, you know, shell from the coast, mm -hmm. um, stone from, you know, from all over, things like that. Um, and they use this uh, and to produce things like beads or bangles or tools. Um, and they produce them, you know, often in an urban context or in, um, or in specialized factories. But then they ship these out um, all over the, the Indus. It's really fantastic, actually, because they, they're shipping them out, you know, these enormous in enormous quantities, mm -hmm. sort of hundreds of kilometers. It's amazing interconnected. Yeah, sort of it's 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 really it's quite spe spectacular, I think, and we're not exactly sure, um, you know, how they're doing it. But one mm -hmm. of the things that we tend to find um, a lot of on sites are these little toy carts made of clay. People always thought that they were toys for children, but um, it's yeah, I think it's it's quite telling and it's really interesting mm -hmm. that we find um, these little miniature <laughs> carts yeah. in such quantities. And to get that sense of. Uh, to get that sense of <clears throat> such a vast empire, because it's a huge, I mean, it's not such a huge land area, yeah. but one that is connected by, by trade and manufacturers is, is absolutely fascinating and tantalizing, I presume, when there's so much that we don't know as well. Yeah, exactly. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit, um, because I think we'll, we'll move on in, in, in a minute or two to talking about, about villages and to talking specifically about your own work. Um, but of the cities we know of, so the, the, the four sites that have been, been excavated. Can you tell us a little bit about what an Indus city looks like or what a, a site that they would look like? Yeah, I'd love to. I actually started off working on Indus cities and now I've moved on to, to working in a rural context. Um, but the Indus cities are really, um, they're really quite exciting because um, they're, they're enormous for one. They're really big. Um, the largest one that we know of is um, at least 200 hectares in size, but potentially, you know, even bigger because they've never found the boundaries. There was this idea that they had um, sort of a, a, a blueprint for building an Indus city, which I think comes from a lot of um, the kind of classical archaeology that people were doing at the time. But mm -hmm. uh, I don't think it's necessarily um, it's necessarily true anymore, mm -hmm. um, based on what we now know. But there's two of them in Pakistan, and there's two of them in India, um, and potentially there's, a, there, as I said, there's a there's a fifth one as well. Um, which is a little murkier because it hasn't really been studied anywhere near enough for us to say something. But if I talk about, say, the largest one, uh, which is in Pakistan, it's called Mohenjo-daro, mm -hmm. uh, and it's really, it's really a fantastic site, and I would love to, um, to see it someday, really. This is the one that I was talking about that's almost, that's over 200 hectares in size. Mm -hmm. um, it's based on two separate mounds, and one which is a, a smaller mound, and it's been called variously things like the Citadel Mound, which was by the, um, the sort of army archaeologist. Okay, this is, <laughs> yeah, you can see what they want to see. Yeah, <laughs> this exactly. yeah, it's very we much might call it the like University that. Mound. <laughs> Oh no, well there was a building there that they said was the, the College of the Priests or something, really? but I don't think we have a lot of evidence for, for a college or priests to, to okay, say that. It's, it's so. just, <laughs> just there happened to be some priests wandering past and this looks for me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> don't mean to be totally facetious. So we've no. got, so we've got a, a citadel man. Yeah, we've got this, this sort of citadel man, which I don't think people um, call it that anymore, mm -hmm. but that's where some of the, um, what you'd say monumental architecture within the Indus context is. It's not um, it, it's not monumental architecture as you would think of for ancient societies, you know, it's not a huge palace, they're not huge temples, they're not building things like that. But what they are building, and this is something that I think has fascinated a lot of archaeologists, um, on this mount they built, um, you know, other quite large buildings, but they built a huge bath, um, really, they built this enormous bath, and we know it was sealed with bitumen, um, and presumably filled up with water after that. And that was really one of the largest structures that they that they built at this city, and it's fascinating because you sort of wonder did they did they really really love swimming? Yeah. <laughs> was it was bathing? Well, you mm -hmm. know, um, obviously people have speculated that bathing had um, perhaps ritual connotations, mm -hmm. um, and because the the cities are actually um, 
they're so well connected in terms of water management, water supply. Um, there is, I mean, there's hundreds of wells at these, uh, you know, at these places, mm. and people have done comparative studies, and uh, it does, it just doesn't compare to what's happening in other parts of the mm. world. It's, it's really an extraordinary amount of wells for, for a population that size. But they also have this complex underground drainage system, wow. which is quite spectacular. And if you see photos of it, it's incredible because it's, you know, it's really well laid out. It, it practically looks like. Like Victorian drainage in, mm -hmm. in in London or something, which is amazing. It's you know, very it's just, interesting, yeah. and it, it, you know it has led people to wonder if they were um, if they were obsessed with hygiene. Mm -hmm. That's that's one of the theories, or um, really if if as I said, bathing had had a very important ritual connotation. If they were um, perhaps obsessed with sanitation to some <laughs> extent, because um, you know most of these houses they have you know they're they're all connected to this tr uh, drainage system. Mm -hmm. um, they have sort of toilets and, and bathing rooms and bathing platforms and things like that so mm -hmm. it's 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 quite strange I think but a really stunning kind of thing to have uncovered as well yeah it's very unusual yeah. I think it, it we don't yeah we don't really understand it and one of the things archaeologists do which um, which people make fun of us for and which we make fun of us <laughs> for is if we find something we don't understand we usually have to say it's possibly ritual because you can't imagine what the what the actual function of it would have been. So ritual, uh, so, going to catch all. So maybe it was ritual, but um, but you know, if you there's there's parallels to that in in I think modern South Asian society as well. Um, so it is very interesting. Um, and that's kind of what's happening on the on the Citadel Mound, mm -hmm. or the Mound of the Great Bath. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's also sort of the much much larger mound, which uh, which is we call things like uh, sort of the lower town. Or things like that, and that's where most of the residential architecture is found. Mm -hmm. um, and the thing about this area is that the the architecture it's mostly made of um, mud brick. Mm -hmm. um, they don't build with with much else, but they but it, it's it's quite fascinating because um, they don't seem to be again building uh, not necessarily larger houses or things like that. And this is one of the reasons why after the site was excavated, one of the theories about the Indus was that. Um, it's, it's an egalitarian, classless society because the architecture seemed um, sort of so dull and 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 really there didn't seem to be much distinction between kind of the sizes of houses and things mm -hmm. like that. Um, and in fact, one of the archaeologists who dug it uh, really early on in the twenties, um, he actually said it was as dull and orderly as a Lancashire mining town. Oh, <laughs> Just, harsh. I know it's harsh on yeah. it's harsh. It's harsh on everyone. It's harsh no, this on is, everyone. This is. I don't feel that that was particularly no. fair. Nor might I add particularly scholarly. <laughs> no. <laughs> Thank you very much. I like to maybe moved on a little bit. But from... I, I like it. It's one of it's one of my favourite quotes. I think of, sort of about Indus scholarship because mm -hmm. I kind of imagine you know he comes out to to India and he sees this this spectacular city. Really, you know, it's enormous. It's sort of the you know, it's one of these these sort of great old world cities. He immediately thinks bloody like, Lancashire. <laughs> oh, great! <laughs> that's um, that's not, obviously no records survive to show whether or not the Indus were any good at cricket, which no. would you know whether they could beat Lancashire no. or not. But if we're judging them based on the current South Asian performance, they were probably awesome <laughs> and a lot better than the English cricket team. <laughs> so, Valaki, tell us a bit about how does the Indus civilization compare to contemporary ancient civilizations? Um, well, that's that's actually really interesting, John, because I think um, it's almost an anomaly when you compare it to um, to other ancient civilizations or other ancient societies. Mm -hmm. I hope that's not too controversial to say because I know everyone sort of says, "Oh no, ours is ours is different." Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, but this really is. Yeah, but this okay. really is, and to the extent that it's often um, actually left out of sort of synthetic overviews of uh, of ancient societies, it just doesn't fit. It just doesn't fit. Oh. For instance, uh, as I said, the Indus is, is really large, and there's mm -hmm. there's at least four confirmed cities that we know of, and mm -hmm. potentially a fifth. And um, the thing is, these are spread out over this really, really enormous area. Mm -hmm. um, and when you compare it to what's happening, you know, sort of in, in the Near East or later on what happens in, in you know, ancient Greece, um, it's really fascinating because obviously while it isn't, it isn't urbanized society, you know, they've developed um, to, to, you know, they've, they've developed and they've built these cities and the vast majority of the population are not living in an urban context. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that's that's really really interesting because because uh, in general yes of course most of the population are, are you know living in in villages or smaller towns. There's also a lot of other things going on. Um, for instance, it's almost uh, it's it's been described by a lot of archaeologists as a faceless society because because yeah. um, we don't really have much um, you know, many images of individuals sort of depictions of individuals you know not rulers uh, not things like that. We don't have have a large amount of statuary. 
um, and we don't have sort of you know large carvings or stele like you'd find um, you know further west. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually just don't have anything like that. We only have a few small samples of, of sculpture and statuary, mm -hmm. um, generally found in an urban context. And for instance, two that were found in, in Mohenjo-daro that are probably the two most famous um, sort of depictions of individuals from the Indus. Uh, one of them is a small bronze statue mm -hmm. of, a, of a naked woman and it's about that big. Okay, so it's just so really very, so very So compared small. to some of the more monumental stuff that we're used to seeing elsewhere. Absolutely. If you compare it to see a statue of Ramses or yeah. something, you know, it, it, it's really, it's very strange. Um, and that's actually a really, really beautiful piece and, and I mm -hmm. urge you, if you haven't ever seen it before, to, to look, it, look it up online. It's actually something that captivates a lot of people because it's got so much personality. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's not really um, rigid. She's sort of standing with one hand on her hip and, mm -hmm. and her head cocked, and and yeah. it's yeah, it's very endearing. She, it's a very very human depiction. The um, movement for that kind of thing. exactly, um, and yes, there's a little bit of cockiness about about her. Yeah. So, um, That's so yeah, people, to... people really, I think people really feel a lot um, for this for this mm -hmm. statue. But there's also a slightly larger piece that's made of stone mm -hmm. um, that's been called the priest king, mm -hmm. um, although we don't know if he was a priest or a king or a priest slash king. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we have no idea, but um, that's made of uh, that's made of stone, like I said, uh, carved. Mm -hmm. And again, that's about that big. So, okay, so still reasonably still, small. This is, yes, you know. really, really quite small. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the, the few other examples that we have that are sort of comparable are all in the same Sort of sort of size um, mm -hmm. range, and we have a lot of terracotta figurines that are that are you know sort of around the same size of um, the one known as the dancing girl. So mm -hmm. they're all about you know sort of that big. So it just seems to, in so many ways, just not fit what we would think of as kind of contemporary ancient civilizations at all. Yeah, really. It's almost like they were doing it just to mess with us. We, <laughs> you know, we sort of, do you it, occasionally it, worry that maybe that's what's happening? I do a little bit because, you know, if we found a really huge elaborate statue, we could say that may have been a god or a mm -hmm. ruler, but we, <laughs> we don't have so any... It doesn't possibly really, faceless. No, possibly. it doesn't give us any clues as to, you know, the kind of religion that they had, the, the kind of things that they valued as a society, mm -hmm. the individuals they looked up to. Um, you know, the kind of political system they may, have, they may have had in place. We just, we don't have clues um, mm -hmm. that you would usually have in other societies. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's, it's quite fascinating because um, you don't know what, what else they're necessarily doing. I, I mm -hmm. mean, you know, how it works over there. They do make a lot of these uh, small seals that are also made of fired stone. Mm -hmm. They're carved um, with um, often a picture of an animal, sometimes an individual or a narrative scene, mm -hmm. um, and with a, um, a row of, of writing um, across the top of it. Um, and these are really interesting because we find them in quite large numbers in mm -hmm. uh, at the urban sites. Um, but they're used for sealing things, um, so potentially they have an administrative function. Mm -hmm. uh, but they also have a sort of little um, boss at the back, which was threaded, so um, potentially people wore them as well, mm -hmm. uh, which is really interesting because, yes. you know, is it, is it a badge? Is it a symbol of authority? Is it... Um, sort of a group membership thing, you know, it could be a lot of different things. And while some of them are very straightforward and which, you know, have, for instance, you know, a bull mm -hmm. uh, or a water buffalo or something, um, others are slightly more elaborate and show um, a man who looks as though he's meditating and mm -hmm. he has three faces and, um, you know, others show sort of a figure in a tree and a row of figures walking up to it and things like that. So... These um, tantalizing signs. It's exactly, so exactly. To... Um, they're probably rituals. <laughs> <laughs> I'm learning a lot, I think, about that. Uh, yeah, you're, you're, this is a like crash course on how to do archaeology. Well, this it's... is it. Well, I look forward to getting out here <laughs> into the fields. But actually, on that note, maybe it's time to talk a little bit more about kind of, um, specifically what you do and what your what your approaches are and what kind of materials you, you work with yourself. Because I think I'm right in saying that you work less with urban contexts, you're much more concerned with, with the rural, with, with, with villages. So maybe if you can tell us a little bit about, about that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, as I said, you know, most of the, um, most of the sites that make up the Indus are not cities, you know, mm -hmm. they're much smaller sites. And to some extent, I think um, they've very much been ignored for most of the time that people have been doing research on the Indus. Um, and I think that's quite problematic because um, you really don't get a complete picture of what's going on and you really can't just study um, cities without understanding the context that they're in or mm -hmm. their relationships with the, the sites around them. Um, and it's particularly if you're trying to understand, you know, the social political organization of the Indus, um, it's really hard to, to figure out what's happening if yeah, you can't right. understand the whole system. Of course. When the cities are so spread out and... Exactly, you know, very much so. I mean, there's, you know, there's hundreds of kilometers between each city often. Um, so it's really, it's, it's hard to say exactly what's going on. Now, I work for a project um, called the Land Water Settlement Project, um, and it's a joint Cambridge-Benares Hindu University project. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, it's a multidisciplinary effort, and so there is, there's a big group of us working on all kinds of different aspects um, of trying to understand what's happening uh, in the Indus in northwest India. And so since 2008, we've been excavating sites and uh, surveying large areas to understand um, sort of settlement patterns. Mm -hmm. Um, and I work on the ceramics for the project. Uh, we also have people working on pollen and uh, climatic data, uh, people working on archaeobotany, people working on zooarchaeology, which are the bones, mm -hmm. um, people working on the geoarchaeology, which are the soils. Um, Such so, an amazing variety. Yeah, of there really, there really is. There's loads going on. Now I'm kind of, um, I, I do what people traditionally think of as archaeology, so which is material. School. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm old school. <laughs> yeah. uh, I do material culture archaeology, but mm -hmm. there's people doing a lot more ice exciting things like isotopes and DNA. Well, I don't know, this sounds pretty <laughs> exciting already. So Danica, you mentioned um, material culture. Can you tell us a little bit more about what that means for archaeologists? Um, yeah, sure, John. Material culture is uh, it's kind of what people traditionally think of as archaeology. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really artifacts. It's the things that people make and use. Mm -hmm. um, it's really, it has to be worked by humans. So man-made um, objects. Just, sort of exactly. Yeah. Um, it, I mean, you know, sometimes it can just be a, a stone that's only been worked a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, or sometimes it can be something really quite elaborate, okay. but again, it wouldn't be... Like um, some of these objects you mentioned earlier on. Exactly, yeah. but it wouldn't be something like archaeobotanical data or um, zooarchaeological data. Mm -hmm. um, it's really specifically the artifacts. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what I work on. And uh, at the moment, I specifically work on the ceramics mm -hmm. that we've been excavating. Um, the thing about working on material culture is, uh, um, for me, it's something that I was always drawn towards. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think now it's seen as being a bit... It's a bit old school, like I said, it's, it's traditional archaeology. Well, presumably the thinking on material culture has changed as well in the way in which we think about objects and their lives have changed, is that fair to say? Yeah, I think, I mean, that's, that's completely accurate. I think uh, it, it's really changed a lot, whereas before you just have studied them as, uh, uh, as objects, um, <laughs> sort of isolated almost, and, yeah. and uh, it wouldn't have really um, focused very much on what they, what they meant to people, whereas yeah. now it really focuses on um, sort of the social relationships between people and things and how things mediate those relationships and, mm -hmm. uh, and how they affect the things that we do. Um, and I think that's one of those things that, that I've always found really fascinating because um, <laughs> when people always say, oh, if, you're, you know, if your house burns down and mm -hmm. all of your possessions you know, are gone, you're okay as long as you still have your family. And obviously I agree, you know, it's much better. To, <laughs> I'd rather have yeah, my family yeah. Yeah. Than, than my things, uh, but it is very difficult to lose all of your it's things. It's not so and simple. Because... Exactly. People say, oh, it's just stuff. It's not mm -hmm. very important. But the things that we, um, the things that we have and the things that we make and the things that we surround ourselves with, mm -hmm. they're, they're actually really important. And mm -hmm. I think they play a really important role in, um, in things like developing um, our identity or mm -hmm. communicating things that, you know, that we would like to say to other people. Um, so they're really they're really quite significant. Mm -hmm. um, Is it fair to say as well that they're not they're not static, they're not passive, that it's not just humans use objects. It's also that these objects kind of can fight back in a way and can have some agency of, of their own. Yes, it's exactly like the one ring if you think about it. <laughs> This is exactly the kind of analogy that I need. Go on. Yeah. Yes, it's exactly like the One Ring, except more evil. We make these things and we imbue them with meaning. Um, mm -hmm. And after a certain, I think, you know, after some time, it's really out of our control. You know, if, yeah. especially if if you think about it, say, um, you know, a group or a political party comes up with a symbol, um, and after some time, the the meaning that we give that symbol is completely out of our out of our control. Mm -hmm. You know, people will. Um, people will continue to see it and attach that meaning to it, you know, whatever else our intentions towards it are. It mm -hmm. sort of develops this life of its own, really, uh, which is something that, you know, I think I find really interesting, this idea of material agency um, mm -hmm. and, and things not necessarily having wills of their own, exactly, mm -hmm. but certainly that, that, um, that it's very much out of our control after mm -hmm. some time. Having a, having a social life and having... Exa yeah, it is the social life of things. <laughs> no, social life of things, of course. And, and having biographies in this case. I think it's absolutely yeah, fascinating. Yeah, it is, it I, is. I, think... I, mean, I know you say it's, it's old school archaeology, but in a sense it's bringing a whole new set of critical perspectives to it. It's really developed a lot. I think that's why, you know, working in material culture isn't, it's not really, it's not really boring. No, well, um, it would seem not. No, no absolutely not. Um, I think sort of the idea of object biographies is also really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and particularly the idea that the presence of an object, or seeing an object, having an object around us would, um, it would make us act in ways that we wouldn't necessarily act if the object weren't there. Yes. Um, and I think that, it, that I find that idea really compelling because, mm -hmm. you know, it's just, it's, it sort of, sort of sounds a little crazy and you think about it more and more, you know, actually it's, it's, yeah, it's very much true. And I think, uh, some people find that really controversial, but, um, it's actually something that, you know, human beings have been using for a very long time, particularly if you think about um, it in terms of ideology and power and communication of that. Um, we know that people have sort of been building, um, say, 
large monuments or large statues to communicate that power. Um, and I think um, it's really, really clear that people have been materializing their ideologies in, in a very deliberate way. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's something that, you know, like I said, it's been happening for a very long time if you look at these ancient societies. And it's something that's continued to happen through, um, you, know, a, 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 you know, as time has gone on. And I think if you look at things like, uh, um, say, sort of Soviet architecture, you mm -hmm. know, um, Nazi propaganda, it's really something very, very deliberate that mm -hmm. we continue to do all of the time. And something that stayed with us. And that's, yeah, it's absolutely yeah. something that stayed with us. And I think um, it's, it's really naive to pretend that it doesn't affect us. You know, there's reasons why, say, you'd, um, why you'd put an army in a uniform, you know, because mm -hmm. when all the soldiers are wearing the same thing, it does something very... Um, deliberate to your identity, you yes, know. It, it, you know who who are you when you're one man in a in a uniform exactly. with, with it, it thousands of others. Yeah, and I think it's really really clear that it does that it does change people mm -hmm. to to be in something like that. With this kind of theoretical armory, I suppose I'd like to get a sense of what do you do on a kind of on a day to day basis as a ceramicist. What are kind of the objects that you are working with and seeking to apply these ideas to? Um, well, the thing that the thing that I like about ceramics in terms of this is that they're um, they're almost they're almost invisible if you think about it. I mean, they're very functional. People use them, and people, um, you know, will be displaying them in their homes and carrying them around. Mm -hmm. um, but they're not necessarily something that people would be thinking about all the time. It's mm -hmm. almost it's almost unconscious. Yeah. Um, and so I think they're um, they they actually provide a really interesting insight to what's to what's happening in a society because um, it's not going to be as obvious as something like propaganda. You know, you're not mm -hmm. making a big poster, you're not making a big statue, uh, but it, you're still making. You know, you're still materializing some kind of perhaps ideology or identity mm -hmm. group, um, some kind of group membership. It can be and to do with with fashion and locality. And yeah, exactly. Yeah. You're you're you can express all kinds of things through your ceramics. But what I do is um, I've been working on these ceramics that we've excavated from village sites in northwest India. Um, my data set consists of about eight thousand individual ceramics. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Which is uh, it's it's yeah it's a really significant amount of of pottery and um, there's a lot of it. And a lot of cataloging presumably to do a lot of things. yes yeah absolutely uh, each of these shirts has to be um, sort of characterized individually so mm -hmm. for every single shirt I've collected um, some amount of data on uh, things like what kind of vessel it came from you know what the vessel form was you know was mm -hmm. it a, was it a pot what I mean was it a jar what kind of jar mm -hmm. um, how was it fired uh, what kind of methods were used to produce it you know was it produced um, by hand or by coiling or by you know a fast wheel or a slow wheel. It's amazing to be able um, to read so much into these. Yeah, you get really an enormous amount of data from ceramics, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's things like uh, uh, things like what they used to temper it with, um, you know, colours, um, and also obviously how they were decorated or any kind of surface treatment that they were given. So I think I mean ceramics are really uh, they're really exciting because actually they, they they're very well preserved most of the time mm -hmm. so you can actually get an enormous amount of data from them whereas often with things like organic material they don't survive as well in the archaeological record and the other thing I think I really enjoy about ceramics is that they're they're such a <laughs> they're such a democratic kind of artifact if you really think about it you know I mean everyone has access to them and everyone uses them they're not going to be something like a gold necklace they're made of clay and most people really will have access to them and they're every day in that kind of way that some yeah, or at least some of them are there. Yeah, absolutely. And you have some that you use every day, and mm -hmm. you have some that are um, ritual or decorative or used um, in a much more elaborate context. Um, and the other thing is, obviously, once they're broken, people tend to throw them away, where mm -hmm. they, you know, very conveniently just often lie in a pit waiting for. <laughs> waiting for, waiting for you. Yeah, this is, <laughs> this is. So, can you tell us a little bit more, maybe, about. Um, what it's what it's actually like because you've been in, you've been involved in excavations as well as performing this kind of painstaking analysis on charts. You've you've worked on excavations as well to get at this kind of material. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've been excavating um, for some time now, and like I said, um, we've been excavating all these sites in Northwest India that um, I worked on my project with. The thing about excavating is that um, <laughs> it's really really exhausting in every possible way because you have to keep. Um, you kind of wildly vacillate back and forth between doing very intense physical labor and between doing some very intense mental analysis mm -hmm. where you just sort of sit there and try to understand what, what's been going on in the trench. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think, yeah, it can be, I think it's quite difficult, but it's also, exhausting. yeah, it is, it is exhausting, but it's also intensely rewarding. And I think one of the things that, um, I think most archaeologists would say it's one of the things that they enjoy most about, um, you know, being an archaeologist, that you get to um, spend so much time outdoors, but also actively engage with your material in such in such an intriguing uh, and unusual way. Mm -hmm. Can I ask? So, with this massive sample size and kind of the amount of excavation and then analysis that you've had to do, what kind of things are you looking to 
uh, are you looking to find? What would you like this this uh, set of material to to show or to illuminate? Um, well, the interesting thing about the kind of material that I'm working with is that um, they're very much the rural ceramics. Mm -hmm. um, now, a lot of the research on the Indus ceramics is focused on um, what people are calling now um, the classic Indus ceramics that are found in urban contexts. But mm -hmm. um, the ones that are found in the villages are actually quite different. Okay. Um, and so for me, that's that's really significant and really interesting because obviously um, it pokes a big hole in the, the kind of homogeneity theory that people have been working with for a very long time so now. So people have previously assumed that there's things are broadly speaking the same yes, across people, the world. Oh, well, context. people have outright said it's, you know, it's uniform across this huge area, which I think is not very realistic. We've um, seen massively in ours. Yeah, so. absolutely. I think it's, it's not necessarily um, what's actually happening. It is a complicated picture because, like I've been saying, they have this really um, very complex network of, uh, uh, of sort of craft production systems and where they transport these beads and bangles and things all mm. over, um, sort of all over the, the entire Indus um, area. But the, the, the reason it's quite strange is because uh, in our, in our site, we do find this kind of, this standard Indus suite of, of you know, material culture, mm -hmm. um, like these beads of carnelian and mm. bangles of shell and fountains and things like so that. So the stuff that you do find all the way across yeah. the Yeah, so there's sort of that um, that kind of homogeneity, mm -hmm. but underneath that there is there's loads of regionalism going on um, And there's all this regional material culture that people have kind of glossed over otherwise And which not, does vary in a way It does really vary, doesn't. it does vary from, from region to region and particularly through the ceramics Which is why the ceramics are so exciting mm -hmm. in the Indus because that's really what people are sort of almost expressing their, their regionalism through and I think a lot of archaeologists are now calling it um, almost a veneer of homogeneity mm -hmm. underlying um, sort of quite a lot of diversity in terms of what people are actually doing mm -hmm. um, and it's almost been really misleading because it's led people to believe that they're you know that they're all doing identical things and it's almost like identical populations mm -hmm. uh, but they're not this allows you to kind of to access that kind of variety and also presumably change over time yeah as well. yeah, yeah exactly so um one of the things that i'm looking at through studying the ceramics is um uh, like I said, these rural ceramics are, are quite different, but they're also quite poorly understood at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just trying to, at the moment, characterize um, the ceramics themselves to develop our understanding of them. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'm trying to build what, um, what archaeologists call a typology, which is basically mm -hmm. when you um, sort of define and group together things into types based on you know, common attributes, mm -hmm. and then you order those types and you know, it, it helps you understand basically what are the different kinds of ceramics that they're making, how those change over time, and then you can compare them to obviously um, ceramics in other areas or ceramics mm -hmm. from the cities and um, just help you on the, get a much better picture of the ceramic economy and what's mm -hmm. uh, what's really going on in this area. Mm -hmm. um, so while I'm collecting all these, these these huge amounts of data from all these tiny shirts, you know, it's slowly building up this much better picture um, mm -hmm. of the ceramics, of the rural ceramics in this area um, so that we can really understand uh, and say, you know, if I've looked over 8,000 shirts and slowly um, checked each one to see how it was, you know, how it was produced and what kind of technology they used. At the end of it all, I can look at how that changes over time in each in each of the sites mm -hmm. and sort of compare that and say, you know, well, it slowly changed from um, from handmade to wheel made or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, and so that yeah, so that really helps us understand how how it changes and how it develops and how it all relates to each other. So you've introduced us to your data set and to some of the things you do with them. Can you tell us a bit um, what kind of material culture theory, as you discussed earlier on, how you apply that to the materials that you work on. Yeah, absolutely. Like I said, I'm trying to build a typology and that's kind of one of the most straightforward ways of, uh, of analysing the ceramics. But in addition to that, I'm specifically looking at the kind of decorative motifs that they use on mm. these ceramics. Um, and the reason that these motifs uh, are significant is because uh, they tend, the forms of the, of the pots tend to be quite similar um, in the urban and rural context. But they're painting them completely differently, okay. um, which is something that people have, people have been saying that for some time, but almost as an aside, saying all oh, the decorations are slightly different. But let's not let's not worry about that. Uh, but for me, it's actually really really significant, particularly when you consider that um, we have almost no other kind of iconography from the villages. Mm -hmm. So this is really the only iconography that we get from them. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's really it's really really exciting that they have this completely different um, vocabulary of of you know. Um, motifs, this kind of completely different visual vocabulary. Um, and so one of the things I'm trying to do is to understand why specifically that is mm -hmm. um, and try and see how it changes from site to site and how it changes over time mm -hmm. um, and particularly as the cities grow and as the urban phase develops and presumably as the city's influence grows as well, mm -hmm. um, does that actually affect what's happening in terms of the iconography 
at these sites. Mm -hmm. um, and like I said about pots, it's it, they're really interesting because people have them in their homes. They display them and they use them, but you don't necessarily specifically think of them as, as you know, as a kind of iconography or as a kind of um, propaganda. And yet um, they're fundamentally different to all of these other things yeah, that we're spread yeah, with. Yeah, very much so. Um, and so for me, it is really exciting that they are doing something very different. And potentially, I think it does um, have links to um, sort of identity construction mm -hmm. and uh, to sort of this, the negotiation of identity. Um, and so they're using these different visual symbols and they're displaying them and kind of I think potentially communicating uh, something very specific about about their identity mm -hmm. um, and potentially that they consider their identity to be different from that of the urban population. Um, now that's kind of very early, um, mm -hmm. sort of very early stages as an idea, but um, it does, I think, bear thinking about, um, particularly, uh, like I said, when <laughs> it is it is so very different. Yeah, and when, it's, and when it's appearing in these particular forms as well. Yeah, so yeah, absolutely. To, and to bring that kind of material culture theory to bear on this and to ask how people use these objects to think with or to imagine their own yeah, how, well, you know, how does, it, how does it affect them? They start out using them differently, but um, the interesting thing is that uh, they don't necessarily change that as the cities grow and develop. So they're kind of holding on to so their pre-urban, yeah, the kind of pre-urban um, visual vocabulary. Which could have a lot more to tell us about about the end of some relations among this kind of among this massive civilization. Absolutely, and I think um, the thing is, we find you know things like the beads and bangles that I've been talking about the whole while. We mm. found them at our sites. Um, and these are very small villages, but mm. they're, they're completely entwined in this, in this um, sort of network, uh, this, in this trade networks. Um, but it's fascinating because while we found things like, a, say, a gold bead at our smallest site, which is, which is less than one hectare in size, mm. um, they don't have any of these classic urban ceramics. Uh, and the question is, is that is that out of choice? Because they have access to all of these other mm -hmm. um, sort of what we call sort of prestige goods or value goods. Um, they have access to, to, you know, to everything else almost. So why are the ceramics missing? So they turn out to be this kind of weird anomaly that could be the key to learning a whole lot more. Yeah, I think I think in a lot of ways they are the key to, to trying to understand it. And I think, um, you know, back to what we were saying about homogeneity, um, People have been sort of saying, oh, you know, they're doing the same thing. Uh, but when you get down to it, really, um, that means that we've been defining these these rural populations by what they're, almost by what they're buying or trading, <laughs> rather than what they're actually they're making, making themselves. themselves. Yeah. Um, which is a bit, I think, it's potentially a bit of a misstep, really, because <laughs> um, we have to see the kind of things that we have to, you know, give more importance to the kind of things that they are creating themselves. It just seems like such an exciting project as a way of, of rethinking what's already, what's still such a mysterious civilization. Yeah, it's brilliant. This I really, is, yeah, I really, really love it. And, is, um, you know, particularly, I think, when you think that you're kind of almost giving a voice to these rural populations mm. that have been ignored for so long. To really change that narrative as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, I do. And I think it shows that there's, um, that there's a bit more going on than this kind of obedient compliant rural population you know that all that you know that it's not as sort of centrally controlled as people mm -hmm. think you know they really thought that you it's know the center complex yeah more. it was very much i think the idea of the you know the center says jump and the villagers <laughs> say how oh, high mm -hmm. um, and we don't know if that's necessarily the case anymore so after a hundred years of investigating the industry we've still got a lot more to, I, yeah. to take off. Well, I suppose my last question has to be, um, it has to be a bit more about kind of the practicalities of the thing because uh, if people can see you can't see this, um, but Danica has basically brought something which I'm totally fascinated about. <laughs> Would you like to introduce us yeah, to... Yeah, I wasn't actually asked to bring it. I just carry it everywhere in case, <laughs> in case there is an archaeological emergency. You have your trowel. Which, which requires it. <laughs> um, but yes, I brought my trowel um, and I think every archaeologist has their own trowel and you get it quite early on. I got this uh, my first year of my undergrad degree when I first started out as an archaeologist. And I've taken it on every dig that I've been on since. And archaeologists are very possessive about their yeah, trowels. Yeah. And sometimes you carve your name into them. You but could also, say it's an object with a biography. It is definitely an object <laughs> with a biography. And in fact, back to material culture theory, most archaeologists name their trowels as well. Really? Yeah, people do name them. 
So, so there's a whole load of... Well, you give them a whole personality. It's, it can be, I think it's a bit weird sometimes. But I think you can imagine those kind of, these bonds that people have. People do. I well. mean, uh, I, I know someone who, whose trowel broke mm -hmm. um, and instead of getting a new one, he had the blade soldered back on so he could have the same trowel. This is, I mean, they're clearly very important. They, are, they are important, I think. It's the trappings of the profession. Absolutely. So to, fin to finish up and to keep up, to keep up with the trowel, I suppose, I just want to, uh, can you give us just one little maybe insight into where you've been with the trowel or the kind of like the kind of digs that, that you've Japan actually done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love digging. I think um, it can be, it's really, really exhausting and it's an awful yeah. lot of hard work, particularly when you um, dig like we do, which is in Northwest India in March. It's incredibly hot, um, mm. but it's really, it's really, really an awful lot of fun. Um, and I think particularly there's absolutely nothing like it because now I can look back at all the ceramics that I'm working on. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I remember excavating some of them myself from the trenches. Um, and when you're digging something up yourself and you know that it hasn't, you know, seen the light of day for, for about 4,000 years. It's something shaped by human hands that then you're the next person to. Yeah, I think it, you, you really, really feel that direct connection to the past. And I think that's really important for, for archaeologists because we are so very far removed from, from the things and the people that we study. Mm -hmm. And it's absolutely wonderful to, to uncover something and take it out of the dirt and, um, I think no one else has touched this for, you know, for 4,000 years. It's wonderful. Thank you so much for bringing that world to us as well. Thank right. you so much. Thank That's you very much. Oh, I'm shaking you. it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this Cambridge PhD cast presented by me, John Gallagher, and produced by Richard Blakemore and Ruth Rushworth produced in association with Crash. If you'd like to hear more from us and for our fantastic collection of PhD casters, please visit the Crash website at crash, that's with two S's, dot cam.ac.uk. Thank you for listening. Mm -hmm.